Good afternoon, everyone. I am Councilmember Carlina Rivera, Chair of the Committee on Hospitals, and I want to start by acknowledging uh, my colleague and fellow member of the committee, Councilmember Antonio Reynoso. Today we'll hear from representatives of health and hospitals and other stakeholders about charity care funding for hospitals in New York City. Charity care funding is otherwise known as Medicaid Disproportionate Hospital Share Funding, or DISH funding. DISH funding has been discussed, analyzed, and scrutinized for many years, and the conversations surrounding DISH funding are nuanced and complicated. Our main goal today is to bring these issues to light in a digestible and public way so every New Yorker has the opportunity to understand and weigh in on these discussions, as well as to ensure that our hospitals are adequately compensated for the care they provide. Access to adequate health care is a fundamental human right, and we must ensure that every New Yorker has access to quality, affordable care, regardless of their ability to pay or their insurance carrier. The city safety net hospitals play a lead role in addressing health disparities and serving our city's marginalized populations, including the uninsured. Since safety net hospitals serve many without health insurance, as well as those with Medicaid, charity care funding is meant to offset the hospital's uncompensated costs. Although DISH payments are primarily intended to provide support to safety net hospitals, some have argued that both public and voluntary safety net hospitals do not receive adequate levels of DISH funding, while some hospitals receive unexpectedly high amounts of DISH funding. Today we will discuss the methodology the state uses to distribute DISH funding. The current process was intended to help transition the state and hospitals from one DISH funding method to another, Yet the current methodology continues to utilize a problematic structure, structure that arguably doesn't take uncompensated care into account as heavily as it should. While it is important to understand the current process and where we've come from, it is crucial that we also understand where we are going. We know the state, as a result of the 2018 budget process, convened a work group focused on dish funding. We know that as a result of the work group, there are various proposals to change dish funding in the works. Today I hope to hear more about these potential next steps and proposals and to better understand how the city could get involved to ensure that the DISH funding process is as equitable as possible. As healthcare continues to change, we must ensure that individuals and communities retain access to care that meets their needs. Today's hearing is a great opportunity to hear about the process by which our hospitals are subsidized for serving New Yorkers who are uninsured or on Medicaid, which has not increased the rate at which it reimburses in roughly a decade. I'd like to thank those who are here to testify today, including representatives from hospitals, as well as community members and advocates. It is crucial to have all stakeholders at the table for this discussion, including physicians, advocates, patients, and hospital representatives, and I look forward to our robust discussion. So with that, I would like to invite the first panel, which is Mitchell Katz, CEO and President of Health and Hospitals, John from H&H, &H. what is you? John, I know, I'm sorry. It's nice to see you, but I, I, I'm getting glasses soon. And as well as uh, Linda DeHart from Health and Hospitals. Oh, give me, give me one second while council administers the oath. And we've also been joined by council member Diane Ayala. Can you raise your right hand, please? Can you raise your right hand, please? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions?
so be, I, taking uh, your challenge of making sure that people uh, who are listening really understand the program, the way that I think about it is that um, the disproportionate share hospital program is supposed to reward those hospitals that take care of a disproportionate share of the uninsured uh, and those with Medicaid. And part of the problem, from my point of view, with how New York State has structured the program historically is it's more like a pro rata program. So everyone gets something for the few or many uninsured people they have. And that is not really, to my way of thinking, consistent with the term disproportionate. The understanding is if you're a hospital and you take care of many patients who have Cadillac insurance and who are able to pay full freight, of course you're going to be able on the margins to take care of a few people with Medicaid or a few people who are uninsured. But that's not what the disproportionate share program was meant to do. That, that it's assumed that you'll just do that because you're a hospital, especially we're blessed by having only nonprofit hospitals here that as part of your nonprofit mission, of course you will take care of some people who are uninsured or who are uh, on Medicaid. Um, what I see the need is to really recognize who are the providers, and it's not just H&H, &H, Health and Hospitals, although H&H &H is the largest provider of indigent services, but that the goal should be to migrate the methodology such that those hospitals that are really doing um, the lion's share of caring for the uninsured and the Medicaid are the ones who have the dollars because we want to provide the services, right? We, all of the money goes directly into making the services available uh, for our patients. Um, so with that, I'm going to, for the specifics, um, we're incredibly lucky uh, that we have John Olberg, um, who used to be at the state and who's a fund of knowledge, uh, and Linda De uh, Dearhart, who's worked for H&H &H for a long time on these issues. And I have to say, as a member of the, the New York State Indigent Care Workshop, it was clear that the two of them knew more than anybody else in the room um, about the program and how it worked. And they had the only, while there were several excellent community proposals, they had the one that the most people from the community signed on to. And I think that that was because it makes major positive steps toward bringing the funding where it's really needed. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, we, we have a, a couple of slides uh, here that we're prepared uh, to discuss uh, today. There's also, I think, some very excellent uh, testimony that was written uh, that includes, you know, a lot of detail and, um, you know, I think fully describes, you know, the situation that we're trying to address here. Um, you know, as Dr. Katz mentioned, uh, the Indigent Care Work Group was convened um, at the request of the governor and the legislature. This is, again, a very complicated issue that involves uh, dividing up a source of dollars uh, amongst hospitals, which is, which is always a challenge. Um, you know, when, when, we, when we started to develop our proposal, you know, we started from a framework of, you know, in essence, you know, guiding principles um, and having some conversation, you know, with Dr. Katz. And I, I think what we, the framework that we started from was, you know, fix the issues, right? Don't create new issues, you know, fix the issues at hand. And there are issues that have evolved in indigent care because since the last time it's been looked at, you know, we've had, you know, the implementation of the ACA and the landscape has, has changed significantly, you know, as a result of that. You know, the second thing Dr. Katz asked us to keep in mind is, you know, we need to be fair and equitable. Um, and, and we tried to take that view here. This proposal doesn't just advantage H&H. &H, it, it certainly, we think, solves problems uh, impacting other, you know, safety net hospitals. So as we go through the presentation, hopefully, you know, you, you can see uh, that work. Um, the other thing I thought I would do is, is perhaps just as an overview of, of the conversation is just, you know, first start with a little bit of background on DISH and indigent care. Again, it's a complicated federal program. 
Uh, seems like it's always evolving. Then we can talk about the problems and challenges as we see it that are facing the ICP program uh, today. Uh, discuss our proposal, and when I say our proposal, it's not just H and H proposal, but you know, a group of community advocates helped shape this. Uh, and then the benefits as we see it, and the impacts of our proposal, and then and then the next steps. I would also say, right, the reason why we try to take this format versus just you know reading up our testimony is that you know we would encourage uh, you know to have a dialogue here, and certainly feel free. If you have questions along the way to interrupt me, um, we, we appreciate that. We like to use this as a learning experience. So moving on you know, to the first slide, um, the overview of the DISH funding and issues. It, first important you know, to mention, as I said, that you know, this is a federal program. We refer to it as DISH. Sometimes we refer to it as indigent care, but in our, in our minds, in our parlance, it's, it's, it's the same. There's really two you know, control points that the federal government has in terms of implementing the DISH. There's what's called the statewide DISH cap. Every state gets an allocation of DISH funding, um, and that's pursuant you know, to a federal formula. And then the other control point is facility DISH cap. So each facility in, in the state is required to undergo a, an audit, in essence. And it's part of the federal rules is you cannot receive more DISH funding than your Medicaid in uninsured losses. And the reason why I refer to that is because over the course of time, um, since the uh, implementation of the ACA, the amount of losses that hospitals are experiencing has shifted from the uninsured to uh, losses not covered by the Medicaid program. And you'll see in our proposal, we, we, try, to, we try to address both of those issues. Um, but that's the importance of the facility dish caps. Uh, today, New York's uh, state receives about 15, 14.7% of the nationwide uh, federal dish allocation, uh, and that's roughly uh, $3.6 billion. H&H is the largest recipient of those funds, so it's about 1.4 of the $3.6 billion. We're very dependent on these funds. It represents you know, approximately 14 to 15% of our entire budget when you include other supplemental Medicaid, so actually a vital source of, of uh, revenue for us. Um, under the current federal law, right, there's this concern, and it's one of the issues that the, that the work group, reasons why they were uh, convened in Albany, is you know, what do we do in the event of you know, federal dish cuts that, that would be you know, catastrophic uh, you know, for New York State, and the estimates are uh, the impacts, our share of the impacts would be $1.3 billion in 2020, growing to $2.6 billion. And our estimate uh, today at h, &H of, of that $1.3 billion, $700 million would affect h and and that's almost half of the cuts. And the reason for that is, is in, in, in many reasons, is because of the complexities of the current uh, DISH program and the sequencing of how dollars are funded within the program. H&H receives the last dollar of DISH funding up to the statewide DISH cap in the way that when you unwind that, and if there's a cut, we receive the first cuts up to 700 million, obviously something that is unsustainable or created a significant burden on H&H. &H. So that's, that's the general background of the program. Um, I can shift to kind of what we see as, as the issues facing uh, the program today and the pressures facing the program today. Um, you know, as Dr. Katz said, the con you know, work group was convened to address some of these uh, issues, uh, advocate, right, develop an advocacy approach to avoid the federal uh, dish cuts, but then also to make improvements uh, in the program. Um, the work group focused primarily on the indigent care program. There's different elements of the DISH program, but what they chose to focus on was what we call the ICP portion of the program, and that's the DISH dollars that flow to all hospitals uh, across the state, and that's roughly 800 million of the $3.6 billion in DISH. So the conversation is, is at the work group is primarily around how do we deal with the ICP uh, distribution. So we see, right, when we look at the current Current program, we see three, maybe four issues that, that are of great importance to H and H as well as I think the other safety net hospitals. The first is um, H and H's total amount of the annual dish allocations are in constant flux, and this is challenging for us because this these dollars are so vital. They're really the last dollar that make our financial plan work. And again, because of the complexities of the current methodology and how dollars are resourced over the past you know, five years or so, we've seen fluctuations 
in DISH funding ranging from 1.7 billion to 1.2 billion, right? And Linda and I, as, as, as the, the finance side of H&H, &H, you know, we always are striving for a little bit more stability and having, you know, more known numbers in our plan. So that's a challenge for us. Um, the other big challenge, as I mentioned, is, you know, H&H &H is first in line for the federal dish cuts. As I explained, the way the method works is that we, were, we receive dollars up to the statewide dish cap, and when that's cut, we would have to absorb the first, you know, 700 million. Um, the, the next one here is what we refer to, and uh, this is what I think was uh, discussed. Um, uh, in, in great detail uh, amongst the work group members is what we refer to as the transition collar. So in 2012, when the same uh, work group got together um, and the task that they were, uh, th the, the challenge that they were uh, tasked with is how to convert the indigent care uh, program and allocation methodology from one that was based on a calculation of bad debts to one today that's based on uh, directly related to the number of uninsured uh, people that uh, a hospital uh, serves. So as part of when you move, you know, these big uh, sizable amounts of funds within a system, it's common to smooth that out. And the methodology incorporated a transition from the old method to the new method. And it's in parlance of us rate setters, it's called, you know, the collar. And I think there was, uh, there was a consensus amongst all the work group members that the collar should be eliminated and we should fully move towards um, uh, the uninsured you know, methodology, which was the intent of the work group. Uh, that move was stalled in, uh, in state statute. And you know, some have asked the question, well, why is that? You know, if the new methodology is, is, is the methodology that people opted for, why not move fully towards it? And th what you find when you look into the numbers, it's, it's really the impact, and it's the impact on the safety net hospitals. And according to you know, the, the health department, when you eliminate that collar, it's a zero-sum game. There's $140 million in facilities that benefit, $140 million in those that have to experience a reduction. But the, the concern quickly you know, comes to the surface is it's the 60 safety net hospitals that would have to absorb 110 million of the 140 million dollars in cuts. Now for H&H, &H, we actually get a benefit of almost 19 to 20 million, right? So this is not really an issue for us, but again, sticking back to our guiding principles, let's make sure that all the other safety net hospitals aren't at risk of default, right? This is an issue that needs to be addressed. And um, as we step through our proposal, we, we can explain to you how we go about doing that, but I know I've thrown a lot at you. If there's any questions, I can, I can keep plowing ahead here. Um, is everybody good? Okay. Yeah. I, I'll keep going, right, and, and you know, we'll piece it all together. Yeah. Keep going. I know okay. that our faces might yes. s seem like, you yeah. know, but. <laughs> Yes. It's <laughs> and then, you know, it's a, it, it is a little difficult sometimes to have a conversation without, like, real numbers from yeah. the state, but we'll continue. Yes. But, yeah, let me, let me go through it. And, and so it's really, I'm trying to, you know, let you, you know, inform you of the problems that we're trying to solve. And then this is now the transition to our proposal, right, and the, and the steps that are included in our proposal. So the first, right, is eliminate the ICP transition collar, right? It, fully implement the new methodology, which was, you know, consistent, uh, you know, with the intent of, of the previous uh, working group. The second is, you know, and I'll step you through this and use an example, but, but the first step here is that we reduce ICP funding for all hospitals across the board. So we take a reduction in the dish, right, and I'll use an example of, say, $100, right? We reduce dish dollars, right, out of the ICP pool of $100. That's comprised of $50 federal and $50 state. So that comes from everybody and goes into a pot, right? We then transition those dollars, the federal and state dollars, into a Medicaid rate adjustment. So the dish dollars come down by $100 and we transition those dollars into a Medicaid rate adjustment. But the new element here is that when we transition it to a Medicaid rate adjustment, we're targeting those dollars to the safety net hospitals and the at-risk hospitals only. 
So we're introducing a new concept which we call tiered Medicaid rate setting. And it, and it makes sense, right? If you're a more predominant Medicaid uh, uh, provider, um, you know, perhaps your base rate should be more. And that's in essence what we're doing here. Now that, that, first, tra that first transaction, for the most part, eliminates for the hospitals that we're gonna experience a reduction it does a lot to cover what would otherwise be a negative hit is the number I said of $110 you know, million. You know, again, these are all dollars that have to be uh, you know, synchronized, but the idea here is to take the dollars from DISH and move it over into the Medicaid rates. And as I said, the real pressures on the system today are really because the Medicaid rates have not been adjusted in, in over 10 years. So that, that's step number two. Uh, there's a step here that uh, we're allocating, you know, dollars to the critical access hospitals. These are primarily upstate hospitals, wouldn't affect New York City, but they too would be impacted by the collar removal. And again, we're trying to have a wide scope here in terms of a proposal. So there's some funds that would need to be allocated to them. Uh, then the, the last step here is there's a residual amount of dollars that are not covered as a result of the collar being removed. And the state has a program, multiple programs, but provides supplemental, targeted supplemental payments uh, to certain hospitals that are distressed. And our view of this is that you'd need to increase those supplemental payments uh, to those hospitals, you know, to protect them uh, from experiencing what we would think could be, you know, significant consequences. And then the last step, if you're following this, is that when we move the DISH dollars, right, over to the Medicaid rate, the federal dollars are still available. And our proposal would allow us and the other public hospitals, right, to draw those federal funds into our system. Right, so not only are we helping the safety net hospitals with targeted Medicaid rate increases, we're using the federal dollars that were going to them as part of uh, the indigent care program and we're absorbing those and we can do that because we're uniquely positioned because we're a, uh, we're a uh, governmental entity that can fund the non-federal share and so can SUNY and some, and some of the other county hospitals. And we share those dollars with the other county hospitals which again have a large role in the system of, of providing you know, safety net services. So that is our method, right? There's multiple steps you know, to it. I hope I adequately explained it to you. Um, You're doing brilliantly. Oh, well, thank you. That's, 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 thanks. Um, so I'll keep moving on, um, and then I'll just talk to you about you know, how we see um, our proposal in terms of you know, the final impacts. And uh, just to go through our list, you know, we eliminate the ICP you know, collar without, you know, harming safety net hospitals. We increased Medicaid reimbursement uh, for the safety net and at risk other uh, needy hospitals, introducing this new concept of, you know, tiered rate setting. Uh, we established the precedent for, right, for the tiered rate setting, leverage new federal Medicaid funds in, into the equation. So no longer is, is it a zero sum equation in terms of how do we divide up indigent care dollars. We've managed to appropriately bring in new federal dollars. Um, and then we believe we're attempting to address the disparity between well-resourced um, and, and needier hospitals. And then we do all this, right, without uh, driving a new cost, right, to the state, right? That was important to us. We wanted to present a proposal to them. They, their global cap is stressed. Um, we, we know that. So this proposal does it at no additional cost uh, to the state. And then in terms, just to finish up, um, you know, our next steps uh, is that, you know, first we need to, you know, finalize our model. It, it's, a, it's a complicated model. Again, we're trying to be balanced. It's a proposal that we seek everybody's input, right, including yours, um, as well as our other, you know, hospital partners in the state. And that's the way these things tend to work out, is everybody, they're willing to work together and share and address the imperfections together usually you can find yourself in a better place. So we, we don't feel like we have it all figured out. Um, we figure we have the good framework, but there's you know, more work to be done and we're you know, partnering uh, with our friends at, at Greater New York to also you know, help us with certain elements of data. And then the next is you know, we wanna work with the legislature and the governor um, you know, to hopefully get our proposal introduced into the final budget. And uh, we've been you know, talking to our partners in Albany feel you know, pretty good about our proposal, um, and we look forward to doing that you know, during the session. 
Great, thank you. So how much uncompensated care does H&H provide on average every year? No, uh, um, so I, I saw, I yeah. saw the, the testimony. I know that 70% of H&H &H inpatient care is to Medicaid and uninsured, and there's about 380,000 patients that are uninsured that you serve, and yeah. on average you receive about $1.4 billion in DISH funding. Yes. So just wondering how much uncompensated care do you provide, and how much of that care ends up being covered by DISH funding? So uh, we received the full $1.4 you know, billion allocation, and we use those dollars um, to, to pay for uncompensated care. Um, you know, those dollars all go in, and, and in some cases, we use those funds to also cover Medicaid losses, but predominantly those funds are fully utilized um, uh, to provide services to uh, you know, the, the uninsured. But I guess the, the, the reason why we're having this hearing, besides you know, awareness, I think uh, many people don't understand the relationship between the city and state and health and hospitals and how dependent we are. And I think the disparity between well-resourced and needier hospitals are probably our biggest uh, question and concern today. So you know, that's why there are so many stakeholders in the room. And I wonder with 1.4 billion, it's still not enough, though. And I guess yes, that's, that's that what correct. I'm trying to get at yes. in terms yeah, of, I know you're trying to redefine at risk and safety net, but it's just not enough to it's, provide care. Yeah, it, go ahead. P part of the thing to understand with the $1.4 billion, that's the amount that the state is paying out to us every year. Those payments are on a lag with respect to the services that they're paying us for. So the state has been able to give us money um, in recent years that fully pays us for uncompensated care at the hospitals through about 2015. There's still hundreds of millions of dollars of uncompensated care for periods after that that we haven't been paid for, and under the current structure, we don't have any guarantee that we will be paid for. And then with every year that the, 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 the delay and the forecast that maybe it'll be delayed again, and if it's not, some of the numbers that you gave us are incredibly troubling of what you'd be faced with. Um, what is the state relationship like right now? I know that you are looking forward to working with the legislator to possibly put forward legislation that's gonna assist with redefining this formula that so many of us, including the people in this room, find problematic. How are those conversations going? Just based on what I saw yesterday in the governor's announcement, there wasn't anything specific. Yeah, no, I think, we think that the conversations are going very well. I mean, they, they called us to the table, they asked Dr. Katz to participate in the work group. We are the biggest, you know, uh, utilizers of these services and providers um, of these services. So um, we feel pretty good about it, right? We, we think we're dealing with multiple issues with our proposal. It, it takes a little bit, as we're doing here, to absorb it all. But you know, we feel as though it's 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 a good proposal. But we welcome uh, other input, um, and 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 uh, and we're optimistic that during the course of the session we we can take that work up. And we heard about the proposal, which um, based on on what you've listed here, it sounds like you know clearly it was thought through, and you had multiple stakeholders in the room. Um, has the work group presented a proposal to the governor, to the executive? Well, we, well, I'll just say, as, so uh, the work group is advisory. Uh, this was the only, uh, John and Linda's proposal was the only one where multiple people signed on and said yes. I, I certainly would have liked to have read in the governor's speech that this was going to be the proposal, um, but that has not yet happened. So. Um, the, basically, the state sees the committee as their advisory body, and I think John is right that they take his proposal and Linda's very seriously because they were smart enough to think of a way to grow the pie, which is always a good strategy, right? If figure out a way to grow the pie, some more people can benefit. Um, but there's no, from, from their side, what they have said is that the proposals that people have made are being discussed at the highest levels of the state government, but have not committed that, that one will come out at a specific moment or that a decision will be made. And I saw some of the supporters um, that Elizabeth Benjamin from CSS and Leon Bell from NISNA and Anthony Feliciano from CPHS, 
uh, Judy Wessler. Was there a general consensus? Was this the majority of the working group that agreed on this? I mean, I know that not everyone. The, certainly more than any other proposal. Uh, so there, you know, there were other people who, right, didn't, didn't sign on, but there was no proposal that more people supported. And there were certainly proposals made that less people supported. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'm glad that you're on board, Dr. Katz. I think that that says a lot, and as well as the advocates who have been working on this for years. And as I mentioned in my opening testimony, I mean, this really hasn't been revisited in a thoughtful way in, in nearly a decade. And so hospitals are suffering. Um, I did want to turn it to my colleagues and not, not take too long. So I know first on deck is Council Member Antonio Reynoso. Oh, and we've been joined by Council Member Francisco Moya. Thank you. Chair, um, so thank you for your testimony and your, I want to call it an attempt to, to inform us on exactly what, is, what existed and what has transpired because it is very dense and like very into the weeds. Um, we don't get a lot of agencies that go into those details with us. A lot of them like to gloss over things and I feel like you went deep into it. So I didn't understand most of it, I want to be honest. Um, uh, but I understand the, the gist of what's happening here. And what I do understand is that we're trying to be creative on how we can move things around to allow for us to continue to uh, support the needier hospitals um, or the hospitals that are doing the neediest work, I yes. guess is what I want to call it, not the neediest hospitals. Yes. Um, if you're doing Medicaid work, um, then you would get support through this alternative program. I wanted to ask federally uh, how uh, would any of this have to go through an approval from the federal government, or how, how, how are they involved, if yeah. at all? No, I appreciate that. Um, obviously, they're a stakeholder here, and um, you know, from the chair that I used to sit in at the state, right, it would be the responsibility of, of the Department of Health as a single state agency, right, to submit what we call state plan amendments, and that's the control point, again, in terms of approving these you know, sorts of policy changes. There's nothing that we see in, in our proposal that we think that they would have any, any problem with. E even the, the realignment and the reduction of the DISH dollars, don't see an issue there. And the tiered Medicaid rate approach, right? we, we would see that they would support that as, as well. Um, had some preliminary you know, conversations with them about it as we were kind of constructing the idea, but we, we think that we would be in a, a good position with them. And then the, I don't think you answered the question that was asked by Chair Rivera related to how much uh, is the overall uninsured uh, debt that we have. Um, you said 1.4 million is how much you get. Yeah. And that it all goes to the uninsured, the, the uninsured debt, I guess, that you, uh, you assume. Um, so can we say that it's 1.4 billion or that this covers up to 1.4 billion, but there is more. It covers. So we would like to know what the more is as yes. well. Yeah. Yeah. No, understood. No, it, it covers. You know, up to the 1.4. And and I was trying to explain, you know, this other control point, the facility dish cap. Right. The facility dish cap is your Medicaid losses and your uninsured losses, and you can't not receive more than that. What Linda was explaining is that these calculations are on a lag, and yeah. we know our cost continue to grow, right, just like any other hospital. And the number of people uninsured that we serve continues to grow, and it has grown, uh, pr you know, disproportionately as a result of the ACA. There's been more pressure on us, more people have insurance, they're seeking care in other places. Mm -hmm. So for all of those reasons, the number is higher than 1.4. Do we have an estimate at this point of what that number is? We th yeah, I think that it would be, again, these are calculations that we're always doing according to the I guess, I guess we don't want to know your overall debt or like since 2015, how, just on a yearly basis, what is the average amount of, of people coming into the, to the health and hospital systems that are uninsured and how much are you footing, what does that bill look like? Well, we're 70% we're right medicaid and uninsured right no nobody in the city takes care of a greater proportion right of mm -hmm. of that those two populations why is it that you can't tell me the number though i just don't get why is it a concern because if it is i'm a partner 
Right, right. So if it's a concern, or is this you don't have the number and you get back oh, to us? Yeah, no, I think right. it's, it's always on an evolving basis that we do these calculations according to the, the rules of the state, right, mm -hmm. in terms of calculating the facility dish cap. But we know, just kind of doing our pro forma analysis, it could be hundreds of millions higher. I can't give you an exact So you give me a number tomorrow, it could be something that's $200 million more or $200 million less. It's just that. We know it's not going the other way. Okay. Right. Right. It'll never be less. It'll so always let, be more. Let's, let's get back to you, but let's agree for the sake of today's meeting, it's hundreds of millions our cost in terms of taking care of uninsured mm -hmm. and the Medicaid population difference is hundreds of millions of dollars more than we receive through DISH. So, yeah, so at least 1.4 billion. Yes, let's just 1.4 plus hundreds of millions. Right, of okay. So that, and then the, the next thing, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm almost done with my questioning, is you get up to 700, you're the first people to get up to 700 million uh, to the cap, you get first dibs on that, and you feel that if a cut happens at the federal level, that the first group, uh, the first funding that goes is that. That's that, right, that and that's the way the state uh, statute is structured. So can, can and if that happens, can the state immediately modify um, the way they, they fund um, H&H &H and just the ICP program in general so that that won't be the case? Because, uh, of course, I get uh, process-wise why that would happen. I just don't see that being a reality that we would just cut your $700 million. Or so that would be the first cut, and then we'll just keep it at that. I really feel like we would be creative in trying to figure out how to be helpful. I just want to make sure that there are systems in place should that happen that we can actually? Yes, no, I, I, that's an excellent question. Um, certainly, I think there was consensus around this point with the work group that it was unfair and that if there were cuts, that should not, the first 700 should not be all absorbed by H&H. &H. Now, again, our advocacy against those cuts is, is where we want to focus our efforts, but y your point's a good one. We need, we need to you know, plan uh, for the alternative. So I think there's, there's, there is agreement there. As I mentioned, our proposal, we're actually drafting up legislation, right, that, that we would prepare to submit um, to the legislature and the governor to consider. But within that statute, we are proposing um, a fairer process by which, uh, if those cuts do in fact go uh, into effect, how they would be distributed amongst all hospitals. To, to the council member's question, if, in terms of timing, if the Fed said, yes, this cut is happening, yeah. Right, that we're all going to fight against. The chair has really helped us in fighting against dish cuts, as, as have other uh, members of the council, which we've been very appreciative mm -hmm. of. Would we have then enough time in the state process to change how the money gets distributed so all of the first cut wouldn't be us? Yes, yeah. and I, I think that's certainly something that we would, you know, why we would like to have some sort of statute in place um, prior to okay. October, right, when the federal dish cuts are scheduled to go into effect. We think it, it's, it's reasonable, right, to have uh, an alternative, you know, method on in-state law uh, and one that we will push for and would appreciate your help on. Yeah. So please, after, you're, after this is done and the state makes their decision, I think we should have another hearing because I would love to know how your advice to the governor, um, and what, what fruits that has uh, results in the, in the labor of, of your work. Uh, I'm just concerned that you'll make a great proposal and won't get everything you want and it'll make it so that we have to do some work. So I would love to hear how that goes. Um, every single working group that the governor has spawned um, is advisory. I just wanna be very clear with that uh, first and foremost. Right. So be, be, caref be careful who your friends are. Um, and the last thing is, I love that this, this committee is one of my favorite committees because what you learn through the work that you do in health and hospitals is like second to none. It's just a learning process every single time. And I'm so grateful to be here to be able to advocate to make sure that we do our best to, to, to help our hospitals. And it's like going to, I feel like I'm in college every time I come to this committee. So I really appreciate the thoughtful uh, work that the committee is doing in finding these hearings that are meaningful and, and important um, and the work that you do to make sure that you inform us uh, on those issues. So thank you I appreciate again. Your thank support. you, Chair, always. Thank you, Council Member. I'm very susceptible to flattery. That, that was my goal. So, um, you know, we, we harp on the numbers a little bit because of our relationship and I would say that we're, we're new and, and Dr. Katz, you and I are kind of on the same timeline in, right. in, in terms of joining the city with a capital C. 
But um, does I want to ask about NYC Care because we were asking about numbers, and there was a recent big announcement. And I want to know: Does the mayor's proposed NYC Care plan affect your advocacy around dish funding? I I don't see that it it affects. But let me let me oh, add I'm one sorry. thing, if you don't mind. No, no, that's my fault. Because when when he announced NYC Care, De Blasio said. And I quote, H&H is running a surplus and has turned its financial situation around. Alluding, and that was the quote, alluding that the city would be able to pay for the new program using savings generated from health and hospital system. So can you just clarify that and explain sure. how it ties to the proposal? Sure. So, and you know, I, th I think there is a way um, to explain it so that, that we're clear to all our stakeholders. So in terms of, you know, surplus, I, we brought in, uh, in our first year together, $150 million more of pure patient revenue by billing insurance. Not by billing patients, but by billing their insurance correctly. And that's above and beyond the budget. Um, and it really represents H&H. That's going to snowball over time, learning how to bill accurately for people who are insured, which is a big portion of what, what we talked about at our initial budget hearing is that, that, that that's the way to avoid the closure scenario of having to shrink. Instead, let's grow and let's do revenue. Um, when, I, when I talk to people, what I, what I always say because of the, this council, this committee, is that New York City has done its part to take care of the uninsured. I need the state and the feds to do their part. Uh, so I don't, I don't see the fact that New York City is willing to do the right thing in any way, you know, saying therefore the state or the feds don't have to do their part. The way that we have estimated, and it's just an estimate and we're happy to keep working with, with the council and with other stakeholders, the cost of, of the NYC care is we assume that the cost of hospitalization is already covered by the state and by the federal government. Because people pretty much, if you get so sick these days that you need to be in the hospital, you don't have any choice. Um, the people I really want to get into NYC care is the 25-year-old woman who hasn't had a pap smear, right? And she's not gonna get one by going to the emergency department either. I want to get the people who are exhibiting the signs of diabetes or hypertension, and I want to, you know, start treating them before they have uh, manifestations of serious disease. And while I'm so proud of health and hospitals, it has been historically a hospital-based system, a system where if you go into the emergency room, you will get amazing care. What has not been so amazing is the customer service if you're an outpatient. Can I get an appointment? Does somebody answer the phone? Is it convenient to get an appointment uh, at your center? Um, what is the wait times? Uh, and often those have lagged. And that's why in crafting the proposal, I feel so strongly that what, what the money needs to do um, is to uh, really focus on uh, getting people the care that they need in the outpatient area. So I'll, I'll ask about kind of the state's role in reimbursement <laughs> rates in a second, but I know that my colleague, Councilmember Moya, had a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Doctor, for being here as always. I was just going back um, to talk a little bit about sort of the conversations you had at the state level and uh, knowing that the uh, state has two pools of uh, ICP funding, one for volunteer and one for uh, the public hospitals. Um, is the fact that there are these two pools uh, pose an issue to the public hospital system getting funding? No, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think, you know, we're in our proposal, we're not necessarily, you know, disturbing the relationship, you know, between the, the current the current structure. We we think, you know, the allocation based on uninsured units and eliminating the collar, right? All those things we think were kind of the intent of the 
the previous work group, and I think even you know supported uh, by everybody uh, involved. Um, so I don't think that that's that's the issue. I think the issue that we're trying to grapple with in our proposal is is really the Medicaid rates that have not been right. adjusted in ten years. 10 years. And if you right. do the fast math on medical CPI, right, over a ten year period, that that results in in, in over a billion dollars. Uh, for H and H, right? So the real issue, right? One of the many issues that we're trying to address here is the lack of a Medicaid rate adjustment for many, many years. Right. And 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 that's the conversations that you've had with the administration uh, in Albany in regards to to this, and this is part of the ongoing dialogue with the, with the group that's being proposed. Yes. Um, and just uh, back to the Medicaid reimbursement, so. I, and I came late, and I'm really sorry if you might have addressed this, but uh, are the reimbursement rates uh, the same across the board um, for all hospitals? In, in our proposal, right, we're introducing this concept of tiered rates, where, whereby the rates would be adjusted and there'd be higher rates for those safety net hospitals that serve uh, a greater number, proportional number of Medicaid and uninsured individuals. So that's the new concept here that we're introducing. I, I, would, I would like to add that the rates are the same for everyone, but then the result is that, for example, in behavioral health, where the rate is very low, only health and hospitals is right. willing to do a large amount of it. Right. So some of the rates are okay, and so hospitals will participate. Um, but. Uh, then there are other services like behavioral health where, you know, we do it out of a sense of mission, um, but most providers are not interested in doing it. Right. Well, that was it. Thank you very much, and thank you, Madam Chair, thank for you. the opportunity. Sure. So why, why haven't Medicaid rates increased in the last decade? Well, I, I would say is, is because there's just ongoing, you know, pressure um, uh, on the state budget or the, the state's global cap. Uh, it, it used to be a feature of the methodology that there would be a annual increase kind of built into the, the methodology and built into the state law and that, that we no longer en enjoy that. Um, so I, I think it's just, you know, pressures on the global cap, pressures on state budgets, trying to find, use those resources other, in other places, but after 10 years, right, it, be, it becomes a, a significant stress and, and certainly more of a stress on those hospital systems that are most dependent on Medicaid, obviously. And I know that you said, and we've been joined by Council Member Maisel, I know that you said that um, the conversations are going well, but what if there aren't any changes to the DISH funding methodologies? How is, the, how is that gonna affect you? And, and, and even if the proposal were implemented, you know, we have a lot of questions about money and the operating deficit for fiscal year 2020 and beyond. And the reason why we asked about NYC CARE is because that's, is that additional city funding? So this is where we, we have a lot of questions. Besides that, a lot of this information, again, is nuanced and it's complicated. Um, we know that you're in a deficit and you're trying to figure out a way to bill and to do things a little bit more efficiently. <laughs> And then they announce NYC CARE, which is additional monies that should hopefully help the system. So we're trying to compare what seemingly are two different things, but in the end of the day, the money is going into H&H. &H. Right. So I know that I asked a couple of things, but I guess it's like worst case and best case scenarios. Where do you foresee the deficit? Should things go your way? And if not, and then with the additional city funding for NYC CARE, where is that coming from? So uh, to answer them uh, in, in your order, so worst case scenario is dish cut happens in October and state does not change methodology. And so health and hospital bears the entire first part of the cut, right? And nobody else does. So that, that's absolutely the, the worst case uh, scenario for us. Uh, then there's, uh, the dish cut does not happen, but the, but the state does not change the methodology, in which case our costs will not be met, while other hospitals that are much better resourced will continue to, in my opinion, benefit from a program that wasn't meant for them. It was meant for health and hospitals and other hospitals that take care of disproportionate 
uh, degree of uninsured and, and Medicaid, which is other public hospitals and some of the nonprofit hospitals. Um, so that, that's um, the, uh, the, I think, next worst uh, scenario for us. In terms of uh, the money, and I, you know, I'm still consider myself new to New York City and how the process works. We're, we've been working with the city, with OMB. I know that the city council has an important role in approving budgets and that the budget process is in front of us. I would say that, the, that uh, it would have been impossible to consider doing NYC care were it not for the council and the mayor's support of the transformation of health and hospitals. So we've already brought down the wait times for primary care physicians. Uh, we've already decreased the wait time for specialty, although the, on that one we have a lot more to go. Um, so a lot of very positive things have happened and those are the things that would enable this uh, to work as a system. But uh, my understanding is that the dollars are they are the, what has been promised or proposed, what the, whatever the right word is, requires your, uh, the council's approval is, would be new money um, to health and hospitals to allow us to provide the kinds of customer service and capacity in the outpatient environment where we've never been able to do that before. Did you mention NYC Care, whether that's, I'm sorry, new, new money? So new money to NYC Care is yes. Okay. What, what can the council do to support your efforts? Well, I think this hearing and all of the hearings that I've been to, this council has been incredibly supportive, and, and you yourself, Chair, and other people around this table, um, you know, have really helped us. I think continuing to advocate with the state um, for why this proposal should happen, why it's a fair proposal, why it grows the pie. Um, I think making clear why they need a <clears throat> to put into statute that it would be unfair for health and hospitals to take the entire cut. Um, I mean, these are you know hundreds of millions of dollars at stake, and so your advocacy means so much to us. So besides pushing for the proposal and lobbying, and I know that budget season is upon us and we'll be having hearings. Um, the one thing I would ask, uh, I guess in preparation for the budget is, you know, when we ask you the questions about where's the money coming from, new money, old money, your deficit, the state, it's it's because we want to continue to increase the transparency between health and hospitals and the city council, because I think that's been a little lacking over the past years, which I'm very vocal about. Um, is so pushing forward the proposal I think also what I wanted to ask was that in terms of your capital budget that's really really important to us that we have a better understanding of your kind of capital needs and your capital plan I don't I don't really feel that well versed on that and I know that I have a lot to learn but uh, my crash course the first year was that there are a number of capital needs at health and hospitals that we would be able to potentially support you with we just don't have the information I, I, I totally agree with that, and I was so happy when Council Member Ayala was at Metropolitan, and we were able to address some of Metropolitan's needs, and I appreciate her advocacy uh, for that hospital and the importance of it in the community, but you're absolutely right. Um, we have a set of 11 acute care and five uh, skilled nursing facilities, and some of them are you know, brand new and beautiful, and some of them really need quite a lot of infrastructure improvement, not to have fancy wallpaper, but to be able you know, to meet our mission of taking care of people. Well, I don't think um, my council member colleagues have any additional questions. I just wanna thank you, of course, for your testimony. Um, I know we have a, a lot of questions as time goes on, on how NYC Care will assist you all in doing um, your job, but also, you know, making sure that we call on the governor to be a little bit more explicit in details on how H and H is funded 
when it comes to the indigent care pool and DISH dollars and the future of the largest public health system in the country. So I just want to thank you for your testimony. I look forward to working with you. Um, and with that, I don't have any further questions. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, John and Linda are able to stay. I'm going to go see patients at Gouverneur uh, for the rest of my afternoon. So I'm sorry I'll miss the other testimony, but the two of them will be here and will tell me what people say. All right. Thank you, Dr. Katz. So we're going to call the next panel, uh, Elizabeth Benjamin from Community Service Society, Carmen Charles. President, Local 420, DC 37, and Anne Beauvais from Nizna. Hi, good afternoon. <coughs> yeah, okay. Is a button pressed? No. Are, okay. Oh, red means go. Interesting. It does. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, my name is Elizabeth Benjamin. I'm vice president for health initiatives at the Community Service Society of New York. Um, I was the co-chair of the state indigent care panel, uh, work, most recent indigent care advisory group. I also served on the indigent care advisory group in 2012. I also served on the indigent care technical advisory committee in 2008. I've written four reports on this subject starting in 2001 when I was the supervising attorney at the Legal Aid Society's Health Law Unit. And I'd like to say we've made some progress on this issue, but not all the progress we'd like to make. And um, the good news is, in our, as a result of our early efforts, we were able to make a lot more progress. Um, I think this past year, it's been a little discouraging that we've sort of flattened out and made almost no progress at all, I'd say, in the past year. Um, so wh why is this important? And I think the reason why this is important is that there are still 1.1 million people uninsured in New York State. Um, that kind of falls in three clumps. One are people that just can't afford insurance even with the financial assistance that's offered, and that's around 300,000 people. There's another vital group that really matters down in New York City, which is immigrants who are ineligible under the Affordable Care Act, and that's around 400 thousand people and then there's a final group that of around 300 plus thousand people who are actually eligible for Medicaid or public programs and just aren't signing up and that's the sort of trickiest last group to deal but there are real proposals that could resolve the problems for the first two um, but regardless since the governor has not proposed any coverage expansions and has only proposed a commission to study the idea of dealing with this last 1.1 million people. It's clear that the problem of a large number of folks, around 600,000 in New York City, who are uninsured and don't have health insurance, you know, and aren't able to access care are going to be coming to facilities like health and hospitals and the other true safety net and securing uncompensated care. So, we, would, we are blessed in New York State because we were one of the few states that actually has resources that the state goes out and gets federal matching funds for to, re, to help uh, you know, offset hospitals' you know, uh, expenditures for providing care to the uninsured. The problem is, is that the way we allocate 1.1 billion of that set of funding is inappropriate. And the reason why it's inappropriate is it 
because uh, and, and it's kind of 85% appropriate and about 15% inappropriate. And you would think, oh, 15%, you know, why are you, why are you still complaining about this all these decades later? And I would say, it's, you know, around $130 million a year. And that's real money. You know, it just is. And that $138 million a year is being inappropriately spent so that there are winners and losers. And the losers, guess what, are the ones that are doing two times more care to the uninsured than the winners. One of the biggest winners is Memorial Sloan Kettering, who, you know, if I get cancer, I want to go to Memorial Sloan Kettering. But the thing is, if you're uninsured, you can't go to Memorial Sloan Kettering because they're not going to give you a financial assistance application. And that's a problem. And it's not me just saying that, it's the data that Memorial Sloan Kettering reports to the State Department of Health that we you know, got under the Freedom of Information Act that reveals it. So that's the problem. Similarly, not, you know, these winners and losers. Uh, New York Presbyterian, over three years, wins $9 million more than they actually spend on charity care. NYU, $5 million. Who's losing? Elmhurst Hospital, $22 million. They're losing over three years. Lutheran, $16 million. They're losing over three years. That's a problem. And that's why this last 15% we're fighting over it and we care about it. So I think, you know, we published a report. I won't bore you on it. You know, it's on our website. I think it's why I ended up becoming one of the co-chairs of the work group this year. We call it unintended consequences. And we show how not resolving that last 15% in, improperly funds hospitals that really aren't doing the work. So the next, so that was sort of my first point. You know, I think there's real things that this committee could do around that. I think one of your questions was, well, what can we do? And I think, you know, writing a letter to the governor and to the second floor of the administration saying, hey, you all never issued, that work group never issued a report. It was supposed to issue a report last December. You have nothing in your budget on this topic. There should be something on this budget. Right now, this transition collar that's allowing this last 15% or $185 million, $138 million to be spent, kind of mis inappropriately allocated, is just gonna keep rolling over and rolling over and rolling over. It will only become 100% accountable in the year 2050. Honestly, I don't even know if I'll be alive in 2050 to write another report on this topic. So, you know, like, let's really, maybe we could speed it up a little. I don't know, just saying. So, um, the second issue that I think is really important is one that I think health and hospitals did an excellent job of discussing, which is, you know, the way the DISH funding is sequenced in New York State is kind of backwards, especially, I mean, it's fine under the current system where DISH dollars are flowing freely. If DISH dollars, if the DISH cuts, the federal DISH cuts go into effect, then it's really problematic having health and hospitals pull last from the, the staging. And so that needs to be right-sized. So we, the Community Service Society, as you all noted, signed on to the Health and Hospitals Community Coalition pr um, uh, proposal. We think that's the way to deal with the dish sequencing as well as right-sizing the indigent care pool. And then the final thing I would say is, you know, why is it that Memorial Sloan Kettering and some of these hospitals are getting more money than actually care they're providing? And it's because we have this law at the state level called the Hospital Financial Assistance Law. It is never been adequately enforced. In the 2012 work group, we were able to get 85% accountable. We talked about that already. But we also got an auditing regime set up. So KPMG, the accountants for the State of Department of Health, would go in and audit how hospitals were providing financial assistance. And they had to follow all these rules. Well, guess what? Even if you, and if you pass the audit, you were supposed to get a reward, like a special little bonus pool. Well, guess what? Even the hospitals that passed, I mean, even the hospitals that didn't pass the audit, that had many, many questions, you know, wrong, passed. So it's a regime that the everybody, you know, what is this, the millennial regime of auditing? I've never seen auditors, like, pass everybody. You know, usually auditors, are, you know, have enforcement mechanisms. But we have this everybody gets a medal regime set up um, in how we allocate the, the, you know, how we pass all the hospitals on the financial assistance um, law. And that's a problem too. Again, it would be great if you all could get involved with that. So that's all I have to say. I'm sorry, I decided it wasn't great to read my testimony. So if I was a little scattered, I apologize for that. But 
It's okay. And we have your testimony for the record, and I think you're absolutely right in terms of contacting uh, the governor because of yesterday's underwhelming uh, announcement, uh, or lack thereof. So uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Benjamin. I'll go in order. <laughs> Good afternoon, Chairperson Rivera and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity of um, allowing Local 420 to lend this voice to this very important issue. Um, my name is Carmen Charles. I'm the president of Local 420. I represent more than 8,000 men and women that work within the health and hospital, hospital system. Many of our members live in the communities where they work. They treat everyone who comes through the hospital doors with compassion, dignity, and respect, which is not always afforded to them. Our members play a critical role in a system which has been structured to serve those most in need, who are also without the resources to pay. According to current estimates, there are some 600,000 New York City residents without federal coverage, as well as another half a million undocumented immigrants who live in fear of coming out in the shadows. For those hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers, it falls upon H plus H to provide the health care safety net. In fact, according to a 2017 report, H plus H provided more than 50% of the state's uncompensated health care, yet received only 15% of its charity care dollars. At the same time, private hospitals, which provide 42% of that charity care receive 85% of those state dollars. The disparity, the disparity is as disheartening as it is indefensible. And now, Mayor de Blasio has unveiled a new plan to provide universal health care for all New Yorkers. We admire the effort. As the saying goes, every little bit helps. Unfortunately, we live in an era where a plan which will provide an additional 100 million to H plus H hospital does little to reduce the projected 6 billion shortfall. Local 420 has consistently held the position that the funding formula is flawed and has a disproportionate bias against public hospital. Let me just repeat that. Local 420 has consistently held the position that the funding formula is flawed and has a disproportionate bias against public hospital, particularly H plus H hospitals. The state refusal to revise the formula in a matter that brings equity to the distribution of the charity care fund is putting an undue strain on the city's finances. We believe that the formula should be changed so that safety net hospitals serving the larger number of charity care patients be reimbursed at a rate reflective of, its, of this service. I want to commend Dr. Katz for his input on the committee, but I believe the committee needs to be more aggressive in dealing with this issue. Nevertheless, if we continue to serve the health care needs of all New Yorkers, this council, the administration, and all elected officials are going to have to work together to bridge the chasm facing our public health care system. This issue has been going on for far too long, and the disparities must end. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you, Councilperson Rivera, for having this hearing and your, and your colleagues on the Committee on Hospitals. I'm Ann Bovey, and I'm representing New York State Nurses Association. I'm part of the Board of Directors of NISNA, and I'm also last year retired after about 40 years of service, um, HHC employee, registered nurse at Bellevue. I'm just gonna cut to the chase in terms of the solution. We know what the problem is. The problem is, is that money isn't going following the patient. Just like with, with schools, you just gotta follow the student. It's just not following the patient. 
And in terms of looking at recommendations regarding that, um, what NISNA has recommended is to fix the current dish and you know, indigenous care pool structure is that it's, we support the H&H &H community proposal and that works to eliminate bad death from both DISH and ICP distributions, targeting more funds to true safety net hospitals. And I guess the other thing that I'm very concerned about is, is that you have these networks, the five big networks, and like for example, NYU has taken over Lutheran, but is the money that they're getting going to Lutheran Hospital, which is really managing those patients? Or is it somehow getting dissolved into the greater system for that, for non-utilization to who that money was intended for? So, um, you know, to, I, the idea is to make sure that truly um, it goes to that safety net hospital. NISNA also supports laws to direct more funding to real safety net hospitals and reduce taxpayer subsidies to profitable hospital systems that don't need and don't deserve subsidies that they're actually getting. Um, NISNA also supports increased Medicaid reimbursement rates for all hospital meeting the de definition of an enhanced safety net under the PHL section of 2807. NISNA supports immediate changing the priority order for distribution of dis and ICP fund pools to remove health and hospitals from the residual and or leftover pool that will bear full and sole brunt of any future reductions in federal dish money. So it's not an also ran, it's up front in terms of first getting the money. NISNA supports treating tiers of hospitals with the ICP voluntary pool based on safety net status to redirect one point, <coughs> excuse me, one billion in that pool to true safety net hospitals and to eliminate funding for hospitals with low levels of Medicaid and uninsured patient or high profits. NISNA supports changing the technical formula for distribution of ICP funds to target ICP allocations, as I mentioned before, to hospitals within the pool with the highest level of Medicaid and uninsured patients. So the actual provision of care is being supported financially accordingly. NISNA supports applying means, means testing to totally eliminate DISH and ICP funding for hospitals that are highly profitable and do not serve significant numbers of uninsured and Medicaid patients. So in essence, you know, looking to what the solutions are and in essence looking to see that the money truly follows the patient. And it's not just, you know, given to um, a network that has huge profit bearing and that is, is, not, is not following that money directly to who those patients need to receive. So for, for those that participated in, the, in the, the work group, do you think it needs to be reconvened and, and what were your experiences like? Um, I, you know, I thought the work, yeah, no, you go. Is that okay? Yeah, no, yeah. fine, no, I said you're the one that was in the work group. <laughs> okay. We were, we just watched. So, I mean, I think it would be nice to get the report out um, where we thought the report was gonna come, we thought that the work group members would see a draft of the report um, in early December and um, we're not sure about the status of it and it would be, you know, it was promised to the legislature in December, and so it would be, I think as a first step, it'd be great to get the report issued. Um, and I think uh, it would be helpful to, you know, have, I think, the work group members be on the record about which work group members were supportive of which proposals. Right. There were several proposals, and I think that would be helpful information to have as part of the report. Um, but since we haven't had an opportunity to comment on the draft or the dra and the draft hasn't come out, published or report, it's sort of hard to know if it would be helpful to reconvene per se. Um, but I felt like we had four meetings and we all understood it would just be four meetings. I think the thing that's completely concerning is the idea that this transition caller just keeps rolling over. And so if the work group does nothing and the legislature does nothing and the governor does nothing, it will sunset in March of 2020. But my big concern is, at the end of March of 2020, my big concern is that they will be continue to just continue it. Um, and as we know, it has you know unintended consequences where there are winners and losers and some of the winners really shouldn't be winners. In fact, 
you know, New York Presbyterian has gone on the record in Cranes Magazine a year ago saying, we don't even need this money. That's right, they don't really need this money, and yet they get tens of millions of dollars a year. So, you know, maybe they could send a nice check to health and hospitals or other safety net facilities. You know, most, most states in the country take, and, and the Institute of Medicine and AHRQ, so the big, the big entities, the big sort of intellectual powerhouses, recommend that DISH funding is only spent on the top 25% of those true safety net hospitals in the state that provide health care to the uninsured and Medicaid beneficiaries. We're one of the few states that spreads DISH money around like it's peanut butter. Right. It's a very unusual practice, and it's really got to stop. Do you think that the H&H &H proposal is going to sufficiently protect the safety net hospitals, including the voluntary ones? Yes. Yeah, um, it's a good proposal. Oh, yeah, no, no, just uh, in addition to that, though, the means testing, I think, can augment what that H&H &H proposal has to offer, not just me, but in terms of what we discussed at NISNA. So that would further secure um, the funding to follow where it needs to go. Um, I do believe, you know, when you hear advisory, I'm always very suspect to that because even if you come up with a good report, that means nobody has to listen to you. But that we, I, th I do believe there needs to, has to be stronger lobbying and maybe even a home rule regarding how this funding needs to be addressed and, and send it to the state legislature, which may have a, a, um, you know, a more sympathetic, I don't, I don't like that word, but a more appropriate ear to the needs of the community, you know, and, and you know, I always find it amazing that you know when people say, "Oh, you know, you have so many hospitals." There's eight million people. There's no other city in this country, or even in the world, that matches the population that we have here. So we need to be able to take care of those people. What the H and H proposal does, it's still it's still a spreading of the money. It's just pushing the peanut butter onto the part of the sandwich that actually serves more uninsured and Medicaid patients. You know, instead of now, it's people, people you know, hospitals that don't do any un insur uninsured patients at all really get get peanut butter. They shouldn't be getting peanut butter. You know, it's like well, they shouldn't I, be getting I, these funds. When you brought up about Sloan Kettering, you know, the incidence of cancer in people of color is is lower than the general population. But when it comes to the actual treatment and morbidity, mortality rates, they far surpass what the, that, that general population. So it's obviously access to care issues. And Sloan Kettering through the years, even when Medicaid first happened back in the 60s, they were a suspect. So was Columbia Presbyterian, so was um, NYU in terms of not meeting the requirements for Medicare, Medicaid, to, to be reimbursable accordingly. So it's like for 50, 60 years, they haven't been doing what they're supposed to do unless they really are pressed to the limit to, to do that. So, um, you know, your support and lobbying accordingly is, is greatly needed and appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Can I also just, um, Judy Wessler couldn't be here, so I submitted her um, testimony as well, hard copy. Thank you. And thank you, and, and please count on us to, to lobby. Uh, this is an impressive, I think, list of people that were included and that have endorsed the plan, and I think that says a lot about collaboration, considering. So thank you all. Thank, thank you, you, too. Thank you. I'm going to ask that Elizabeth Wynn from Greater New York Hospitals Association come up. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Chairperson Rivera and other members of the committee. I'm Elizabeth Wynn, the, the Executive Vice President of Health Economics and Finance at the Greater New York Hospital Association, and I was privileged to be a member of the Indigent Care Pool Work Group uh, that is the discussion of topic um, this afternoon. Um, the Medicaid DISH program provides $3.5 billion in funding to New York State hospitals, including about $2 billion to New York City hospitals 
in recognition of the uncompensated care um, losses that they incur from treating uninsured and Medicaid patients. This funding is really critical to ensuring the access to care for low-income, uninsured, and other vulnerable populations in New York City and throughout the state. Um, John Olberg and uh, Dr. Katz did an excellent job of describing some of the intricacies and uh, technical details associated with the calculations. Um, I've outlined some of this in my testimony as well, um, but I just wanted to briefly touch on two topics this afternoon. Um, the first is the real threat of um, federal Medicaid dish cuts beginning on October 1st. This is really the most critical issue facing our member institutions in 2019. Uh, New York's share of these cuts are estimated just in terms of the federal share at about $600 million in 2020 and $1.2 billion uh, over the next five years, or $6.6 .6 billion. Um, if implemented, these cuts would really severely jeopardize the ability of safety net hospitals to continue their patient care missions. Um, this is our top advocacy priority this year, and um, we'll be working closely with the congressional delegation, our member hospitals, um, and we'd really urge that you support our advocacy efforts on this. Um, second, I wanted to touch on the implications of um, ending the transition collar um, that, ends, that uh, expires at the end of 2019 under current law. While it's easy to conjecture that a transition is no longer necessary, it's important to understand the implications um, of this transition on certain safety net hospitals, including many in New York City, and the challenge is really how to balance and uh, address these issues. In my written testimony, I've provided a table depicting uh, the impact of eliminating a collar on different groups of hospitals including the city's what we call watch list hospitals or those that are in severe financial distress um, and receiving extraordinary uh, financial support from the state and also it's of essential safety net hospitals. Straight elimination of the transition collar uh, would mean that the watch list hospitals would incur losses of about $22 million and the essential safety net hospitals would incur losses of over $45 million. Five of the city's essential safety net hospitals would lose more than uh, $5 million each. Um, these include Brookdale, Jamaica, Montefiore, St. Barnabas, and SUNY Downstate. Uh, given their already extremely financial fragile condition, these hospitals simply can't sustain these losses and maintain access to services for their communities. Um, so the issue of eliminating the collar is really complicated and needs to recognize the uh, unintended consequences, or any solution needs to recognize these unintended consequences. Greater New York's in the process of evaluating uh, the proposals brought before the work group, including the HNEH consensus, uh, community consensus proposal, as well as the NISA and other proposals with our governance committees um, to determine our advocacy position. Uh, this exercise, however, is really complicated by the uncertainty of the federal dish cuts that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and again, restoration of these cuts is really our top priority in Washington, and the success on this effort uh, really will require the energy of all impacted. I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you so much for being here. Um, you're currently still evaluating all three plans. You haven't endorsed any proposal, including the one put forward by HNH. Is That's that correct? correct. Uh, we have a board of governors, and we will be we've started discussions with them, but we'll continue those discussions uh, in our meetings over the next few months. When do you think you'll have? I mean, th you know, there's a, a number of. The working group was clearly very diverse, and um, they have put forward a proposal, uh, some of them, and I think that Dr. Katz said there was more of a consensus on this than a consensus on anything else, uh, something like that. So when, when do you think you'll have some sort, of, some sort of answer or a little bit more details on what you're supporting? Because clearly you all agree that there is a problem. That there are, as, as Ms. Benjamin so, I think, uh, concisely put, there are winners and losers. Yeah, so we will, you know, we continue to work through our governance process. We have a couple of meetings scheduled over the next month, uh, and so 
we'll, you know, we'll see where we are uh, in about a month. How are you looking to expand what hospitals are considered safety net hospitals? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? How are you looking to expand what hospitals are considered safety net? There's a lot of discussion on how to redefine safety net and at risk and who gets the dollars. So how are you working on that? Uh, so one of the things that we always look at is the payer mix uh, of the organization. So what is the percentage of Medicaid and uninsured as well as uh, Medicare patients, um, hospitals that treat a large proportion of government payer patients uh, tend to be the most financially distressed. Um, Medicaid, given the rate freeze that uh, was alluded to earlier, only pays about 75 cents of every hospital dollar, uh, and Medicare is covering like roughly 85 cents for New York hospitals. Um, so therefore, those hospitals with a large proportion of Medicaid and um, Medicare patients uh, tend to be the most financially challenged. Uh, so that's one factor that we've been looking at. Uh, one of the concerns with the existing uh, definition that's in state law around essential safety net is that there are essentially cliffs that get created uh, because you have to meet kind of hard dollar, or hard uh, percentages in order to qualify. Um, sometimes we look at approaches of kind of doing kind of a gradual tiering. Um, so it's a kind of a more of a bell curve as opposed to either you're in or you're out. So you uh, pointed to a, a table that was in your testimony that I, I find very helpful regarding the impact of eliminating the collar. Do you, do you have figures for what this would look like under each of the proposals? Uh, you mean each of the committee, uh, the uh, ICP work group proposals? Um, I don't, but not with me today, but I believe those were provided to the committee, um, each of the kind of proponents or the support or the uh, sponsors of each of the proposals did provide those to the work group. Um, so that's something that we could give you. Yeah, can you, can you send that to us? Mm -hmm. we'd, we'd lo I'd love to see that. Um, you know, we, we are, again, uh, this is all about, in the end, is just addressing the disparities um, between well-resourced and needier hospitals, and I know you have a very uh, diverse, I guess, membership or, or group. So I am looking forward to um, kind of what your final outcomes are in terms of what you decide, and if you could get me those numbers, I would really, really appreciate it. And thank you, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. So with that, I'm going to call, there's two more, right? The last panel, uh, Rusa Tikkanen, from the CUNY School of Public Health, I know you're independent, and Anthony Feliciano from C the Commission on Public Health Systems. Uh, the last one, anyway, so I'll see you downstairs. All right, good afternoon. I will jump right in. Uh, my name is Rosa Tikkanen. I'm a former research associate at the CUNY School of Public Health, and I'm delighted to join you at this hearing this afternoon, and thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Um, today, I will be sharing with you research findings and recommendations regarding charity care payments made from the state indigent care pool to New York City hospitals from a report that I co-wrote in 2017 for the New York State Health Foundation. I'll start with some background and then I'll step into the actual report findings. So as you know, the indigent care pool was established in 1996 as the bad debts and charity care pool with a goal to compensate hospitals for care provided to uninsured and Medicaid patients according to the level of need due to providing charity care. The pool is funded through federal Medicaid disproportionate share hospital or DISH funds and state taxes collected via the Healthcare Reform Assessment, or HICRA. And as noted earlier, it currently re redistributes approximately one-third of state Medicaid DISH dollars. Prior to 2012, several investigations, including those from Elizabeth Benjamin and colleagues and um, the Commission for the Public Health System, had concluded that payments from this pool were not adequately channeled to safety net hospitals and recommended that the state revise the payment formula. 
In 2012, the state did exactly that, in part to comply with new federal requirements. The Affordable Care Act prohibits using federal DISH dollars for hospital bad debt, that is, uncompensated care provided to insured individuals. Instead, DISH funds can only be used to pay for charity care, i.e. uninsured care. The state thus renamed the pool as the indigent care pool and removed bad debt from the calculation formula. However, as we've heard today, the state decided to phase in this new methodology very gradually. Um, we've re heard uh, refer referrals to this as the transition caller in the interest of protecting individual hospitals from large revenue fluctuations. So now I'll jump into findings from my report um, that was submitted to the New York State Health Foundation. So in 2017, me and my colleagues at the CUNY School of Public Health published this report that investigated whether the 2012 reforms to the indigent care pool payment methodology had resulted in one that more fairly compensated safety net hospitals. And for this report, I analyzed data from the New York State Health Department examining charity care payments made to New York City acute care hospitals. My report found that New York City private hospitals were more generously rewarded despite providing less uninsured care. The 12 public hospitals in New York City, including Health and Hospitals and SUNY Downstate, provided more than half of all uninsured services in the city, or 58%, but received only one-seventh of total indigent care pool dollars paid to New York City hospitals. To further illustrate this disparity, I will share an example. Jamaica Hospital, a private nonprofit hospital, and North Central Bronx, a public city hospital, both provided approximately 45,000 uninsured services in 2013. Despite providing similar levels of uninsured care, Jamaica received an ICP payment of 34 million, which is eight times greater than that received by North Central Bronx received, which is four million. Further, we show that indigent care pool payments are not related to need measured as uncompensated care costs, i.e. the hospital financial losses from uninsured services. We found that the average private hospital in New York City incurred between six and eight million dollars in uninsured losses, yet received indigent care pool payments that exceeded these losses by 50 to 80 percent on average. Some hospitals, such as Lenox Hill and Brooklyn Hospital, received indigent care pool payments that exceeded their uninsured losses by more than tenfold. In contrast, uninsured losses for the city's public hospitals averaged at 42 million, i.e. four to five times greater than for the average private hospital, yet their indigent care pool payments compensated only a fraction, or 18% of these losses. We found that there are two key provisions in the indigent care pool distribution methodology that prevent these funds from going to true safety net hospitals. One is the transition payment formula that we have heard being referred to as the transition caller earlier today that was introduced as part of the 2012 reforms. It sets a floor and a ceiling for indigent care pool payments relative to previous years' allocation. In 2019, the floor is set at 17%. This means that no hospital can lose more than 17% relative to what they received in the previous three years. This floor increases by 2.5% each year, and as Elizabeth Benjamin pointed out earlier, this means that the indigent care pool will be fully implemented um, in terms of this new methodology by 2050. The, statutory, the second provision in the distribution methodology is the statutory caps on public and private hospitals. These are currently set at 139 million for public hospitals across the state and 994 million for private hospitals. Because private hospitals provide fewer uninsured services than the public's overall, this higher cap essentially guarantees that these facilities continue to receive indigent care pool payments that exceed their need. I will now move on to the recommendations that we made in the report to, re to more fairly reward safety net hospitals. One, we recommended that the transition payment formula or caller be abolished or accelerated because it continues to link indigent care pool payments to historical allocations. So although the new methodology in 2012 is more equitable than previously, it is being phased in so gradually 
which means that the majority of indigent care pool payments continue to be tied to hospital bad debt, which is now disallowed under the ACA. Two, we recommended that ICB payments be better targeted to a smaller group of hospitals with the greatest needs. This is because the majority of hospitals in New York City are eligible for indigent care pool payments. However, this means that these crucial funds um, should be better targeted to a smaller number of true safety net hospitals as they are in other states. Number three, we recommended that the pools available for public hospitals from the indigent care pool be increased to more closely align with actual provision. The city's public hospitals are unfairly disadvantaged by the 139 million cap imposed on public hospitals, especially seeing as they provide the vast majority of charity care. Four, we recommended that the state impose a facility level ceiling for maximum indigent care pool payments that cannot exceed their need, i.e. uncompensated care costs. And this is because some hospitals in the city receive millions of dollars in ICP payments without incurring any uncompensated care costs, while others receive payments that far exceed their actual losses by several fold. Five, we recommend that the state monitor nonprofit hospitals as charity care provisions. This is because in New York State, the state law mandates that private hospitals operate as nonprofits, i.e., charities. While some private hospitals in the city are true safety net hospitals, other institutions do not provide much charity care, yet they continue to receive tax exemptions worth millions of dollars each year because of their charitable status. And I will note that there are some states, such as Illinois and Pennsylvania, that require nonprofit hospitals to meet minimum charity care requirements in order to keep their tax exemptions. Um, to close, I would like to make a note on urgency. The way in which New York allocates its charity care payments to hospitals is not only a matter of complying with federal regulations, but also of social justice. New York City has a highly segregated hospital system whereby black and minority patients as well as uninsured and Medicaid insured individuals are disproportionately served by the city's public hospitals and safety net institutions. In the past two decades, the city has seen several safety net hospitals shut down in low-income areas while public hospitals have been financially struggling alongside. And when charity care funds fail to reach these institutions, their patient populations also suffer as a consequence. I thereby urge the city council to work together with the State Department Indigent Care Work Group as they revise the payment methodology. Thank you, I'm happy to take questions now. Good afternoon, my name is Anthony Feliciano. I'm the director of the Commission on the Public's Health System. It's always good to have Rusa and our other colleagues uh, uh, say the right things because then that means I don't have to always repeat myself here. So I'm just gonna go and shorten my, my testimony and to say why I'm here. Um, some hospitals reap the benefits of getting state charity care funds but continue to not provide sufficient care to immigrants and low-income communities of color, people of color. Access to health care has been seriously reduced and will continue to be if more hospitals continue to be financially bleeding, especially public hospitals. I'm not sure that in yesterday's governor's state of the state address that the increase in funding in health care will fix that. Um, partially it's because we have not learned all the details. But I would say that we've mapped out so many closings over the years and even when they close, they don't, they don't benefit the community. They turn into other real estate um, value issues. But I also want to say that charity care funding determined must be changed so that more closely matches with uninsured and people on Medicaid that are treated. I'm gonna skip some of the historical and the history piece and some of the political gaming that's happened in the past and go to page three and say that we have to be aware of several critical issues regarding both federal DISH and ICP funds. One, powerful political and monetary influences have been used to tilt charity care policies toward the protection of acad academic medical centers and profitable hospitals often to the detriment of community hospitals, pu public hospitals, and the communities that they serve. Several private hospital networks operate with huge surpluses and serve very low percentage of up uninsured and people on Medicaid. The large private hospitals have grown into multi-site healthcare networks and have positioned themselves to benefit from changes in the healthcare sector. The combined net revenue of the five major private hospital networks were 877 million in 2016 up and over one third from six, 650 million for all five in 2014 and 2015. 
We now have some legal definition in the state hospital code that defines public hospitals, urban and rural voluntary hospitals that provide critical services. Although this is separate from the ICP funding, it provides some guidance around the ICP method for change. Uh, the other one is HHA remains exposed to the brunt of looming federal dish cuts. Allocation of dish funding is unfair, the sequencing as well as you heard before. And then you also have the Affordable Care Act um, actually reduce dish payments nationally because uninsured would be more eligible, but we know in New York State we're still serving many uninsured and people that are still not eligible, as you heard before. So basically the, the distribution method needs to be equalized and fair. And so we support all the stuff that Health and Households proposes is a part of and also NISNA. So I'm not gonna go through all the pieces of that, but I will say and I reiterate what um, Elizabeth said. Um, when Manny's Law was put together and around financial assistance, we still have hospitals not providing the information around financial assistance and it needs to be more closely monitored and protected. Uh, particularly as we know that medical debt and other issues and quality of care and also access to care is so important. So thank you, um, Councilman Carlina Rivera and staff. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I wanted to ask um, to, you know, based on, on your, on your <coughs> I guess your studies, uh, Ms. Tinkinen, you know, you heard some of the proposal that was put forward, I guess that was endorsed by, including uh, Anthony is one of the people that have supported a uh, proposal. I know you don't have a, a lot of details about the proposal besides maybe what you saw, if you saw the slideshow. Um, but do you feel it's in the right direction? I mean, based on what you've said, I, I mean, I see a lot of, this is probably the, the one, one hearing that I would say we're very, very all kind of aligned and we all share a lot of the same ideals. Um, do you see the proposal going in the right direction based on your research? Because some of this, some of the, this, I don't want to call it anecdotal because you're giving us actual hospitals and what they received compared and the Jamaica example was um, to me very, I guess, enlightening. Do you see it going in the right direction? Yes, yeah, so I actually have the details of two proposals in front of me, um, including the Health and Hospitals Community Coalition proposal. And the one thing that we've heard today is the alignment seems to be in the area of the transition caller, which I recommended either accelerating or eliminating entirely. Um, however, I have not analyzed the impact of them. The other area that I didn't touch upon in my report was the Medicaid rates. Um, obviously, the reason we have indigent care pools at all is uninsured and the fact that Medicaid rates are low, and it should be noted that the indigent care pool was founded in 1996 when NIFRM, which is hospital rate setting, was abolished in New York State. Um, Maryland is the only hospital that continues to have that system. Um, and, you know, if I got to rebuild a system from scratch, that is one thing I would introduce is all payments to all hospitals, regardless of which insurance you have. So that's obviously an important piece of this puzzle is to increase mm -hmm. Medicaid rates. Um, and then the other area where my recommendations align with these proposals from New York Health and Hospitals and NISNA is the fact that, like I pointed out, a lot of nonprofit hospitals do not clearly have a charitable mission and there is an attempt to uh, make a distinction between those voluntary hospitals that are true safety nets versus those that are not, um, and that I definitely endorse. And, and uh, Mr. Feliciano, what, what would you say your experience was like? You were part of the working group? No, I wasn't part of the working group. I participated by going there and part of the actual coalition, so. So what, is, what was the experience like in terms of, because there's a number of stakeholders, right, that were included that I know you work really closely with and you have an, an amazing relationship with over the years. Um, do, you, do you feel like they got to in the four meetings and, and through some of the work that you've seen address enough of, of the issues that we find so troubling? I don't think they fully addressed. I think they should have met more times, but when there was consensus around the transition collar removal somewhat and some of the other stuff, it's not the question of the consensus that have an issue, it's the question of how you're gonna do it. And that's where you see the differences across the board um, with the folks that were there. Uh, the majority of folks who were there supported some of the H&H proposal, the tier system um, design and all that, which I think would uh, address a lot of the issues. 
but there's also this issue of political gaming going on, mm. and it always goes on. Um, and so I think we need the council to step up, even if it's not in your purview in terms of your powers, is to really get to your state colleagues and tell them why it's important to make the change and all that. Um, the other piece of it, I think, is um, going to back to what Elizabeth said. One thing is to get the report out, another thing to also get it implementable and think through. Um, and so those are some of the issues. I mean, the work group, as folks said, there was a lot of good folks on there. I don't think it was diverse enough, but it, uh, that's not the issue that we have to deal with. Now we have an issue of there's nothing in the state budget that we can see or we know of in terms of details that really addresses or prioritizes charity care funding and the fixes that need to happen. So I just want to say that I know that there was a recommendation for us to, of course, to lobby the legislature, which we'll certainly do, and whether it's in Albany or it's in D.C. or it's here in New York City, uh, you all have my commitment. And, and we will be contacting the governor, so I hope that I can call on the people in this room to, to support me and assist me, assist me with making sure that that messaging is direct and on point and comprehensive. So I just want to thank you all for being here, for, for giving us your time, uh, for continuing to work on this for years and decades. And um, I really do appreciate all the work you've done around healthcare because I think we all agree that it is a human right. And right now in one of the most progressive cities in the world, not everyone has access. So um, I don't have any further questions, but I just want to again thank everyone. And I want to thank H&H &H also for staying and, and listening to, to the testimony today. And with the seeing no one else to testify, uh, we are going to adjourn the hearing. Thank you so much, everyone.